I'll try that again. Good morning to you all. It's good to be back up here. You know, I, over the years, I think we, my wife and I, we took one vacation where we were gone for two weeks, and I thought that was a long time. I'll tell you, I don't know if it was five or six weeks with that uh, illness that I was out, but it seemed like forever. So for me, it's a real delight to be back up here. Before we get into God's Word this morning, let's all bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our most gracious and loving Father, we do thank you for this day. I thank you, Father, for each and every one here. I pray, Father, for any visitors that you would bless them this morning, that they would feel welcomed, and that uh, this time together, Lord, that you would be glorified. Father, we need to hear from you today. We do not need to hear from me. So I ask, Father, that your spirit would minister to the hearts of each and every one here, that we would become enlightened, if you will, to areas of need in our lives. And, Father, that you would take control of it all. We ask your blessing upon it. We thank you for your presence here this morning. And we ask you to do what only you can do, and that's minister to our hearts. And we do thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, before... Uh, before we get into the message... I wanted to share with you a, a thought from my quiet time. Or I shouldn't say quiet time because it ended up being in a, an extended time of uh, meditation over a number of years. When God first spoke to me about it, I wrote it in my, my journal and wrestled with it, and then I wrestled with it some more. And I kept thinking it couldn't mean what I think it means. But I continued to wrestle with it. And so I'm going to share that with you this morning before we actually get into our subject matter. Because I think it's very relevant for each and every one of us here. If you are a Christian, then you need to pay close attention. If you're not a Christian, then you need to grab a hold of me or Pastor Brian after the service, and we'll explain to you how to become one. But in Luke chapter 17, verses 7 to 10, the scriptures tell us if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and, and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. But which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which, he was, which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you ha do all the things which are commanded to you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have only done that which we ought to have done. The things that I got out of this verse were these five. We might call them five marks of a bond slave. But every one of us, if we've come to Christ, then we are a bond slave. We have willingly chosen to follow Christ. He is our Lord, and therefore what he speaks, we are to obey. First of all, he must be willing to have one thing on top of another put upon him without being given any consideration. That one would be hard enough, wouldn't it? You work all day in the field, it's hot, you want to come in, sit down, have something to eat, and drink a big cold glass of iced tea or soda or whatever your fancy is. 
but you're not given the opportunity to do that. You have something else put on you, and then something else, and then something else. Secondly, in doing this, he must be willing not to be thanked for it. Consider that in our lives when you serve Christ. You serve because God has put you in some ministry or some area, whether it's at your job or whether it's at church, wherever it might be. And so you're given one thing on top of another. And sometimes I hear wives say that that's what their husbands do, and other times I hear husbands saying that's my wife's honey-do list is it's going to take me three lifetimes to get it done. And they mumble and they grumble. But we are called to do it without any consideration being given us. And in doing so, we must be willing not to be thanked. And thirdly, when we have done all this, we must not charge the other with selfishness. And then having done this, there's no gr ground for pride or self-congratulation, but we must be willing to confess that I am of no val real use to God or man in and of myself. It's only by Christ that we can do the things that we are commanded to do and have the attitude that we are commanded to have. And then lastly, this is where the bottom of ourself is completely knocked out from under us. And this is the last step, that the admission that in doing everything that we have done and bearing what we have in the way of meekness and in the way of humility, that we have not done one stitch more than it was our duty to do. I want you to consider that because this overshadows what we're going to be looking at probably for at least the next two weeks. It's a topic that has come up very, very often. It's a topic that uh, in all my years of marriage counseling, I've seen it again and again and again. I've seen people leave the church that they're in because of it. I've seen people that have separated husbands and wives over it. I've seen brothers and sisters struggle with each other, and you got the Clampets and the Bodines or the McCoys and whatever the other family was. And they sit on different sides of the church and they refuse to look over at the one that they're upset with. The scriptures tell us to cease from anger and forsake wrath. And I ask you to bear with me. Some of the medication I'm on keeps my mouth pretty dry. But there was an, an article. I'd like to talk to you about managing anger. And it's something that I think we all battle with to varying degrees. But we need to understand it from a biblical perspective. There was an article in Newsweek on January 3rd of 1983 that said this, better temper that temper. It raised the question, is it best to let off steam? Is it best to let off steam which reduces our blood pressure but produces, but produces hostility in others? Or is it best to suppress one's anger, which raises blood pressure, but it prevents hostility? How are we to deal with anger? It serves us well to examine this. And if you say, well, I never have any problems with anger, 
Give me five minutes with your children or with your roommates, and I'll prove that's not true. Because we all struggle with anger. Some to greater degrees than others. Some might get angry and just hold it in a little bit, and then they finally, then they get alone with the Lord and let it go. Other ones let it go like a cannon. And boy, everybody within range gets knocked down. In the Old Testament, we're going to do a, a brief over, overview, if you will, at anger. In the Old Testament, the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, they have a lot to say about this whole area of anger. And if you're not one given to reading the book of Proverbs, I would challenge you to read Proverbs every day, one chapter. If you want the wisdom of God, if you want to know how to deal with life, not just anger, but finances, relationships, work, diligence, patience, the list could go on and on. Then you need to get into Proverbs. It has a lot to say from our Heavenly Father on going through life. There are two passage, passages that provide this warning. One is Proverbs 14, 17, where it says, He who is quick-tempered acts foolishly. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9, Do not hasten in your spirit to be ang angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. And then in Psalm 37 and verse 8, David shares this with us and it pretty well sums it up. He says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. I think if we, in a sense, did a little survey here at the church and we asked, how many of your parents ever said something that was hurtful? Or if we went and surveyed those in prison, how many of those individuals had their parents telling them, you'll never amount to anything, you're going to end up in prison? or you're stupid, or we make fun of our child or somebody else's child or whatever because they're obese. Maybe it's happened to you, but it wounds a person very deeply. And sometimes some of those wounds will never heal. I remember I said something to my mother after I got home from overseas. And it was not a kind thing. Very hurtful thing. And I remember as soon as it rolled off my tongue in that moment of anger, I remember the look in her eye. And I can still see it to this day. And of course I apologized as soon as I said it. And she forgave me. It still didn't take away that hurt, did it? Some of you can identify with that. And it didn't take the hurt away from me because I still clearly remember the damage that a loose tongue can cause. Consider the New Testament. First of all, it appears that anger is not compatible with the, with the Christian disposition. As Christians, we're called to a higher standard. As bond slaves, we're expected to let God change us. But when we have the attitude that you have no idea how much this person hurt me, 
or surely God must understand. Or, well, that's the way, that's just the way I am. I've always been an angry person. When we come up with excuses, we remain immature. We don't progress in our Christian life. Because you see, if, if we do something that hurts somebody or offends somebody, God gives us a couple of commands. He says that if you know somebody has ought against you, in other words, if I know that Brian has something against me, God commands me to go to Brian. If I have something against Brian, God calls me to go to Brian. You see, in both situations, God puts the responsibility on us as a Christian to make sure things are right. Why? Because you are the testimony of the living Christ before a world that walks in darkness. And if we choose not to do it, we will c continue to make soft, easy choices. Choices that will not change us. Choices that will not benefit us in our growth. Because we, we are missing something here. Our spiritual growth is dependent upon our heart desiring Christ. And any time we think that Christianity, Christianity is a smorgasbord where we can go down and say, I'll obey this and I'll obey that. Well, skip that one. I'll obey this and I'll obey that and skip these next three. What we are actually saying is that we don't find Christ worthy enough as our Lord to obey him. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, anger and wrath are to be replaced with kindness and forgiveness. Stop and think about it for a moment. What kind of a testimony would you bear before the world if you never had evil to speak against anyone? I remember hearing this story, and this is supposedly a true story, of a woman that never spoke evil or spoke ill or put anybody in a bad light for the 50-some years that she had been a part of the church that she was in. And the pastor thought, what a testimony. Now, this lady was in her 80s at the time, and the pastor said, thought to himself, what a testimony this woman is. And then he thought, I'm going to try to pull one on her. You know, some pastors are into joking around. I don't know of any myself, but some pastors are into joking around a little bit. And so the pastor went up to her after the service, and he says, Hazel, what do you think of the devil? Now, you can't really come up with anybody more evil than that, can you? He said, Hazel, what do you think of the devil? And she thought sort of long and hard, and she says, well, you've got to admit, Pastor, he is awfully persistent, and that's a virtue. <laughs> Anger and wrath are to be replaced with kindness and forgiveness. Why does God tell us to forgive? Well, first of all, that's his nature. 
and we are to grow into Christ's likeness, are we not? So first of all, it's his nature, and we are to grow to be more like Christ. So I want to do that. I want to demonstrate kindness. I want to demonstrate forgiveness. But there's another reason that we do it. Forgiveness only hurts you. Or excuse me, unforgiveness only hurts you. You see, when God commands us to forgive, we let go of it. But as long as we hold on to it, we've got, a, in a sense, a, a corroded artery that's going to stop things from working the way they should with our heart. And bitterness that goes along when we have anger and we don't deal with it, we start to become bitter. And that bitterness can destroy us. I've seen what bitterness can do to people. And the older they get when they haven't dealt with it, the more they're mad at the world. And the more that nobody can please them, Why? Because we're harboring something. We're carrying something that God never intended us to carry. We're told in Colossians 3.8 that as it goes on with things that we are to do, you know, God, through the Apostle Paul, oftentimes says, put off and put on. Put off anger, put on love. Put off unforgiveness, put on forgiveness. So we don't just get rid of something in our life. It's kind of like my father in law when he gave up smoking. He put off cigarettes and he put on pounds. Why? Because he was eating candy to supplement, if you will, that need. When Paul tells us to put off something, he never says just put it off. There's always something else that we're to put on. Why? Because God wants to, if you will, change our inner clothing. So garment after garment of these filthy rags that have filled our life, we remove and we put on Christ. Piece by piece, Area by area, character quality by character quality, we put on the character of Christ. James tells us in James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, he says that we are to be slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let me ask you to think about something for a minute. Generally speaking, when we get anger, when we get angry, somebody has done something to bring to open the door in a sense for that anger, right? They've opened the door and we choose to go through it. But in that, if they're 99% wrong and you're 1% wrong, or you're 100, one one hundredth of 1% wrong, you still carry some of that burden, don't you? When we get angry, all we focus on is they're 99 or whatever that percentage might be we fail to look at our itty-bitty part in it. So we justify our anger 
when what we should be doing is repenting and ask forgiveness for our one percent. You see, I can't point at you and say, you get it together here, young man, you've got 99 percent, or, you know, I'm thinking this, but I might tell him to get it together. And so he takes his, his stand, why? Because he sees my 1%. And so nothing gets resolved if I go to him and say, hey, I want to apologize for this, whatever that was. That's all I need to bring up. You see, God is more concerned about his spiritual growth than I am. And as long as I do what's right, in a sense, we could say it frees God to work on his heart. But as long as we want to handle it, God will let us until we get things so messed up, finally we just, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle this. He says, I know I was waiting for you to get to this point. How much better would it be if we got to that point before we had to move anywhere? Before we had to go through the things very possibly God's discipline. As we go through the New Testament, we look at anger. It's not to be a part of the Christian disposition. But there also, it seems that we also note that there, are, there is a place for a certain type of anger. Jesus expressed anger on several occasions, one of which was towards the money changers in the temple. And I'm not going to read all those verses on it, but I'm assuming you understand that Christ went into the temple and these money changers were selling things and making the house of God a place of business. And Christ dealt with the money changers, flipped the tables, etc. You find that in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. And then he also got mad at the, the hypocritical Pharisees. You know, the word that they translate for hypocrites is actors. They're just going through the motions. There's no heart. And you know, as a Christian, we can get that way. We can just go through the motions. Well, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. And God must understand. Let me, let me remind you that the God that we serve is an absolutely holy God. Yes, he's a God of love. But his primary characteristic is holiness. In fact, when Je Jesus wanted to make a point, he'd say, truly, truly, right? And when he said, truly, truly, it was like, listen up, listen up. Get this. Get this. It's important. But you know, it's only in the book of Revelation where it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Three times. Get this, he's holy. Get this, he's holy. Get this, he's holy. And we're not to play games with him. God is a God of anger as well as a God of love. Consider these verses here. Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 2.5, But because of, the, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. 
Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Some pretty strong words that Paul is sharing. And we can talk, say, well, what about Paul when he said, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. We're going to speak more on that verse in a little bit. In fact, I think rather than getting into the next section here, we will wait and pick up on that next week. But for the record, if there's someone here that says, I don't have a problem with anger, and you really don't believe you do, you know, that is fine. But that doesn't mean you can sleep through my sermon. Because you have friends, you have neighbors, you have children, grandchildren, that need to hear about how to manage their anger. It's something that everybody battles. And one doesn't have to look too far. We can pick up the newspaper. On any given day, husband shoots wife. Why? Well, I didn't mean to do it. I just sort of blanked out. Why? Because he was in a fit of rage. Or somebody got mad and they decided to use their automobile to run into a crowd of people because he was mad about something. We don't have to look far. It's all around us. And uh, I had three different series that I was ready to go with. You see, I had some time off, and I put together three series and was all ready to go. And I was praying on which one I was supposed to use, which way God wanted me to go. And then I was talking with one person. They were telling me about their battle with anger, and I thought, oh, wow. That's a, that's a problem for a lot of people, but I didn't think too much about it. And then a little bit later on, I met with somebody else, and they were talking about how they're always angry at their wife. And over the course of two weeks, it started out when I first started to think about this, talking on this subject, that there were five people that had come up. Well, over a period of two weeks, there have been 11 that just out of the clear blue started talking about anger, and I thought, I can't get any clearer than that because I think we all battle with it to varying degrees. Many years ago, a woman went up, and we'll close in prayer in a second, but a woman went up to Dr. Billy Sunday. I don't know if you know who he was, but he was a, a professional baseball player turned evangelist. He got saved, and... Boy, he was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. He'd climb up on that grand piano and he'd just... Powerful speaker. And after one of his uh, fiery messages, a little old lady come up to him and she says, Dr. Sunday, I need your advice. And he said, what is it? And she says, well, my husband, he's not a Christian. And so he's always belittling me for reading the Bible and telling me how I'm giving money for causes that are not anything good. I'm just wasting my money. And he tells me how dumb I am to spend the morning reading my Bible and how my Christian friends are all phonies. And the list went on and on and on and Finally, Billy Sunday says, well, do you argue with them? 
oh, no, 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 no. I'm a Christian. And then she paused for a minute and she says, well, I do blow up every once in a while, but it only lasts for a second. And Dr. Sunday said, so does a shotgun blast, but look at the damage it does. You see, it's in those few seconds. It didn't take me long to spew out what I said to my mother so many years ago. Only took a couple of seconds. But look at the damage it did. And my mother forgave me. But there's still residue, if you will, from that shotgun blast. Some people never forgive. They might pack up and they might leave. They might go to a different city. I don't want to be any part of this family anymore. Some people leave the church. Some wives or husbands leave their mates. Some children run away. All because of that five-letter word, anger, and what that encapsulates. Let's pray, and then come back next week, and we'll continue on with this. Our Heavenly Father, we pray, Father, and we ask you to, to speak to our hearts. Father, as King David said in Psalm 51, search me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Search me. I would pray for each and every one here, Lord, that you would search their hearts and show them if there's somebody that they need to forgive, that they would do it today. If there's somebody that they need to go to and ask for forgiveness, or maybe tell them that they forgive them, Father, that those relationships would be restored. Father, I pray that you would have your way with each one of us. For, Lord, we are your bond slaves. And when we have done all that you have commanded us in the spirit of meekness and humility, Father, we've only done that which was our duty to do. So we thank you, Lord. And thank you for this time together and what you're going to, the work you're going to do in the hearts of each and every one here. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if I could, um, Kathy just told me that as far as signing up for Euchre Night, which is on the 17th, we really need to know today if we can. Um, you can probably call Carol or Kathy sometime during the week by the 10th, but if you can uh, maybe put that on your <laughs> in your memory right now on your way out to check the sign-up sheet and sign up for that. Again, that's uh, the information's in your bulletin. Please join us. Thanks. Morning. Good morning. After John's mess message on leadership last week, it got me to remembering about back when I was in the leadership position. I was a deacon in a church for a number of years, and I was a deacon over property in a growing church that was growing in numbers and building size. So it meant that I was in a lot of meetings with committees and contractors and whatnot, hours and hours. But we were a congregation where